Good morning, and welcome to Mount Vernon Place United Methodist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Today is Sunday, February 18th, and Pastor Yost is sharing a message entitled, Jesus Sought Me. Based upon the 25th Psalm and the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Jesus doesn't seek out trained rabbis and priests to be his disciples. Instead, he calls a few Galilean fishermen to follow him and join his ministry. In this story, Jesus tells Simon Peter to drop his nets one more time, even though they have been fishing all night long and have caught nothing. To their surprise, they haul in nets bursting with fish. In response to this abundant miracle, Peter says, Go away from me, Lord. And yet, Peter and his partners drop their nets and follow Jesus. What is the beginning of your faith story? When has God sought you out? Have you ever felt like your calling was purpose or chasing you? Did you resist? Did you follow? We pray the message this week blesses you and encourages you for the week to come. The 25th Psalm, verses 1 through 10. I offer my life to you, Lord. My God, I trust you. Please don't let me put, put to shame. Don't let my enemies rejoice over me. For that matter, don't let anyone who hopes in you be put to shame. Instead, let those who are treacherous without excuse be put to shame. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Teach it to me, because you are the God who saves me. I put my hope in you all day long. Lord, remember your compassion and faithful love. They are forever. But don't remember the sins of my youth or my wrongdoing. Remember me only according to your faithful love, for the sake of your goodness, Lord. The Lord is good and does the right thing. He teaches sinners which way they should go. God, God guides the weak to justice, teaching them his ways. All the Lord's paths are loving and faithful for those who keep his covenant and laws. And now... The Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, entitled in our translation, Jesus Calls the Disciples. One day, Jesus was standing beside Lake Gennesaret, when the crowd pressed in and around to hear God's word. Jesus saw two boats sitting by the lake. The fishermen had gone ashore and were washing their nets. Jesus boarded one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, then asked him to row out a little distance from the shore. Jesus sat down and taught the crowd from the boat. When he finished speaking to the crowd, he said to Simon, row out further into the deep water and drop your nets for a catch. Simon replied, Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing. But because you say so, I'll drop the nets. So they dropped the nets, and their catch was so huge that their nets were splitting. They signaled for their partners in the other boats to come and help them. They filled both boats so full that they were about to sink. When Simon Peter saw the catch, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Leave me, Lord, for I am a sinner. Peter and those with him were overcome with amazement because of the number of fish they caught. James and John, Zebedee's sons, were Simon's partners, and they were amazed too. Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. As soon as they brought the boats to shores, they left everything and followed Jesus. 
The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Recording in progress. Let's start with prayer. God, your spirit was tangibly present on the lake shore that day. May that same spirit be the one that guides us in this place and leads us where we are. Amen. So this kind of begins our series on wandering heart. And um, as those that have been around for a while, you know that I'm a fan of a sanctified art. They incorporate art into their work and they build beautiful resources that we get to use. Um, and sometimes I wish that they didn't give me such a wide amount of information for each week that I could use to try to go in so many different directions for the sermons. Uh, but the whole point of this series is to follow Peter's wandering heart throughout the season of Lent, to follow Peter's journey with Jesus as a disciple from the boat all the way to the cross and beyond. So this series will actually even take us one week beyond Easter where we get to see Peter's encounter with the resurrected Christ. And I'm a huge fan of it because of the fact that it's got the whole wandering heart, a conversation I got to have at the probably 10 o'clock hour this morning is talking about living with ADHD. And I am very much prone to wander. And so I'm very frequently uh, at work just like singing in my head whenever I'm telling children, because I also teach full time at City College. Hi. Um, and so if you're looking for me and I'm not in my room, I'm prone to wander. So you'll find me somewhere. Just message me in the, our Gmail app and, and you'll probably find me faster that way. But the series, because of this wandering heart line, each week looks at a different slice of the song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And so after I'm done talking today, we'll take a moment to actually sing that song too. And so this week we look at the Jesus sought me aspect of that. A brief fun fact about Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, it was written by Robert Robinson during his brief stint as a Methodist. He started off, uh, he basically converted to Methodism from the Anglican Church um, under the teaching of a Calvinist preacher that was a uh, working with John Wesley early on in our Methodist history. And then later he kind of became Baptist. But for those sweet years that we have him as a Methodist, he wrote one of what I think is the best hymns in our hymnal. And so as we're following Peter, the question is like, why are we following Peter and not one of his other disciples? And if Paul writes so much, why aren't we talking about Paul? Because Paul's writings are actually the earliest writer, writings we have about Jesus. So like if we want to actually know about the church around the time of Jesus's ministry, like wouldn't we want Paul? Well, tradition I found out is actually that the gospel of Mark is inspired by the sermons of Peter. Hmm. And then for the theological nerds out there, the most recent theology um, theory that we have is called Markan priority. The idea that Mark was probably written first as the shortest gospel, and then Matthew and Luke borrowed Mark and adapted Mark for the way that they wanted to talk about Jesus. And so we have Peter with his two little letters and then a whole gospel inspired by his preaching and then two other gospels that are adapted from a gospel inspired by his preachings. So he's actually substantially more important than we typically give him credit. His name shows up 181 times in the New Testament as opposed to Paul's only 177. And so it's interesting to follow Peter because Peter we know is just a lowly fisherman. He's in the family business. He owns the boat that Jesus gets on. And as we talked about a few weeks ago, this means that he was not chosen to work with a rabbi. He had done all of his studies, and he didn't make the cut as the fancy theologian of his time. But since we know his name was initially Simon or Simeon, we know that he spoke Aramaic and Greek. And so he was bilingual and clearly a well-respected businessman. 
especially since he's the one with the boat. He probably inherited it from his father who had taught him how to fish. It's worth mentioning now that his name is initially Simon. He's later renamed to Peter. And so the gospel texts refer to him as Simon or Simon Peter or just Peter quite frequently. As a fisherman, he's connected to the Gentiles substantially more than the religious elite. This is the type of person that Jesus is going after, is someone who knows the people as opposed to someone who knows the text too well. All four, Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, and then we find out James and John worked together as fishermen. This actually means that they probably lived in houses with the same courtyard and same main exit to the rest of the world. And so they lived in close proximity to each other. As they were navigating this family business, it was overly taxed and feed by the Roman authorities of the region. So all four of our early disciples were no strangers to oppression, no strangers to working all of this labor just to have the government of the time take too much of it away. And more specifically, talking about long days to just barely survive after the taxation. We know from writings around this time that fishermen were incredibly important. The fishing industry is what kept this region alive, but they weren't necessarily well respected, which kind of makes sense if we think about how we treat service industry workers today, that they are the lifeblood of our society and yet not very well respected. COVID-19 taught us that very quickly about who was respected as a society and whose life was worth putting on line in order for us to survive. And so this gets us to our passage right before it, at the end of Luke chapter 4, Jesus was actually staying with Simon Peter, and so with all four of these fishermen likely nearby, and Jesus shows up and heals Simon's mother-in-law. So this tells us that he was actually married, so the fact that he abandons things later is an interesting um, attribute that we don't really think about the fact that any of the disciples were married before they had joined Jesus. The fact that Jesus was staying with them is probably why he initially listened when Jesus showed up and was like, yeah, I know you just had a long night, but like, I want to get on this boat to talk to these people. And so he already had seen what Jesus is capable of, and Jesus' miracles alone in the region had already gathered a crowd. Another fun fact that I discovered throughout all of this is that this boat, these fishing boats, this is the standard type of boats that they had around. And so these are also the same type of boats that Jewish rebels used in their pushback against Rome around this time. It happened at multiple times in the time period. So I'm left wondering, did Jesus choose this boat because it's the type of boat that the fishermen used and the rebels used to speak against the time, the authorities of the day? Or did the rebels see Jesus's message and those that stayed behind afterwards have this inkling of hope to speak out to those who oppressed them and picked up the same boats that Jesus preached on in order to go and push back. I don't think I get to find the answer. I tried to figure it out when all these things happened. And there's, if you want a really fun thing to look up, you can look up Jesus boat and they've recovered a boat from around AD 67, which would have been the type of fishing boat that Jesus would have preached from at this time. And Frank has seen it. It's, it is not impressive to look at because it's just the bottom slats of wood now, but it's cool to get a perspective of size. So regardless of when the boats were used or who used them, Peter listens to Jesus and goes back out into the water after a long night of work and probably without his full crew of five people. He gets a front row seat of Jesus's preaching. It's interesting that in Luke's account, we don't find out what Jesus said. That's not the big part of the story. Jesus is already preaching. He has no disciples yet, but apparently this is his big recruitment opportunity. Jesus, after preaching, turns to Peter and is like, go ahead and drop your nuts. I know you didn't get anything the last night. Go ahead and drop your nuts. And he doesn't believe Jesus at first. And gives a bit of a pushback. And so I wonder, like, does he not believe Jesus? Because, like, as a teacher, I don't need a theologian and preacher telling me how to run a classroom. Uh, I'd like them to stay in their lane. And so even without his crew of five people, is that, like, why he's pushing back? 
And because this drag net method of fishing, they would cast the net out. It would have floats at the top and weights at the bottom so they could like drag a whole bunch of fish all at one time. And so we're talking about something that takes like four or five people. So I could understand like pushing back against Jesus, like, yo, bro, it's just me and you. Like, this is not enough people if we catch anything. But like, you know, I'll listen because we didn't get anything anyways. I know the water better than you. But then they secure a large catch, way bigger than they anticipated. He even has to call James and John from, to, from the shore to come back out on their boat with both boats barely floating from all of the fish that they have. And these boats could hold the crew of five and 15 passengers. This is like 30 people's worth of weight of fish on these two boats. So I'm left wondering, why does he resist this catch? It's pretty huge. Like, is he afraid of just losing the boats? Instead, he confesses to being a sinner, which is not necessarily what I would expect. But for some reason, he felt that he was unworthy. Did he feel unworthy because of his past, his societal status as a fisherman? Or just does he feel like a sinner because he initially doubted Jesus when he told him to do what he did? But one thing I'm noticing, if we've got 30 people's worth of weights of fish, they can survive off of this for a long time. This catch makes it. This catch makes it so that all four disciples can actually join Jesus and know that their family will be taken care of. Any doubts they had the night before watching Jesus heal Simon's mother-in-law are erased because of the fact that Jesus showed up and made sure that they had what they needed. Jesus didn't just seek out these four boys. He helped take care of their families. He equipped them with the means of necessary to follow him and abandon all things familiar with him. The cliche saying is God doesn't call the qualified, but qualifies the called. I wonder if our psalm for today is a part of their prayer in this moment as they make this transition. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Teach it to me, because you are the God who saves me. I put my hope in you all day long. Jesus' presence brings peace in this transition, which feels oddly familiar for me, um, and kind of weird because, like, I finished this sermon this morning, and um, what I wrote is that, you know, I'm leaving teaching, or at least for those that know, no, some of you don't know. I'm leaving my career of teaching, and right now I'm part-time as a pastor in the General Conference of the United Methodist Church. We have no idea what it's actually going to do. We thought maybe this time we'll have queer liberation at the denomination level. But we don't even know if it'll be valid at this point because we somehow can't secure visas for those that are going to show up and change the rules. I don't know what my appointments will look like because this congregation is only part-time. And if I'm full-time, that means I have to be at least one other place. And there's so much uncertainty, and I'm left wondering where to go. Finish my sermon this morning, and I go ahead and do what everyone does when you have downtime, start perusing social media. Facebook does the lovely, remember this day on this many years ago. I realized that today, 13 years ago, I accepted my position as a long-term sub at Baltimore City College High School. I remember walking up the hill to that castle, trusting the spirit as a St. Mary's County boy coming all the way to Baltimore, trusting that the spirit was in that moment and that if I was supposed to be there, I would be there. And then I get the job and that single moment led to where I am today, even though I thought I was avoiding a call to ministry. And so I shared about that and about how like I trusted the spirit then and I hope to trust the spirit during this transition because let's be real, it's hard when we're worried, when we're anxious, when we're going through change. And so I shared that on Facebook because why not? And I already had several people comment, people that I only met because of my journey, friends from seminary, from two different seminaries showing up and just reminding me that I'm apparently the one that's good at following the spirit in my friend group. And uh, maybe that's why I'm here as opposed to in the seats. But so many times when there's big transitions, it doesn't feel obvious that we can easily trust God. 
And if we think about it and zoom out a bit, who are we going to become in this season of transition? We have a bunch of anxiety and stress. And I know that we've got decades of anxiety and stress just in the physical building here. And wondering what does that mean and who's going to own it and who are we going to be as a people? And while all of that anxiety and stress is real, I feel like the peace that Jesus offers us is also real. So as Jesus seeks us collectively and individually, what scary transitions are we going to follow Jesus through? We've got a big one that's easy to choose as a community, but there's so many that we get to walk with each other through. We've got new life phases, upcoming moves. Um, as a vet would say, her little baby going off to college. Saying goodbye to loved ones. For a season or for a final time. At least on this side of eternity. We have so much going on in our little community. And at the same time, we have to wonder what nets are we holding on to that need to be dropped? What things have we been taught about God do we need to let go? I know early on in my life, I was taught that God was distant. And I look at our world and where we are right now, and I can't have that God. That distant God is not going to help me get through this season. I need a God that comes after me and walks with me through the tough circumstances and transitions I need the grace that comes running after me when I need it and when I'm heading in the wrong direction. The one that inspires my friends to be up way too early on a Sunday morning and respond to the posts at the right time in order for me to get to the place that God needs me to be. There's plenty of other things that we might need to drop. Images of ourselves, things that we understand about ourselves might need to be let go of. When we fall for the lies of society or other people telling us that we're unworthy of God's loving embrace, it's time to let that go. We have to let these things go because we know the truth that Jesus seeks all of us, where we are and who we are. And I think this is actually a beautiful image. And um, this is, you know, when recording for YouTube is, yeah, it is what it is. And we'll, I'll not be on the screen, but um, at least for the recording, you can switch to the picture for a little bit. And for those on Zoom. The image this week from Reverend Lyle Gwynn Garrity is of Peter and the net of fish going through his hands. And so I want to close our time together with her words in the um in her reflection in this image the bursting nets transform into a river of grace meandering through the composition of peter's life the river pours into peter's hands but he can't quite grasp the fullness of this gift and calling quite yet and so most of it rushes by as you will see in her other pieces from the series, the river of grace will wander alongside Peter throughout his life. The river represents how his journey with Christ begins and ends with an abundant catch of fish. He is forever tethered to the overflowing love of God. The river is a symbol of Peter's gifts. As God uses what Peter knows how to do well, being a fisher of fish, and invites him to apply his skills to a new calling, being a fisher of people. It's a visible reminder of the ways God's grace bends and turns and rushes to find each of our wandering hearts. Despite Peter's resistance, grace seeks him out. His right thumb gets caught in the net. He can't escape the fact that God's goodness and mercy will pursue him all the days of his life. The river rushes in. The question for Peter and for each of us, is will he follow where it leads? So let us pray. God, it is your spirit and grace that rolls through our lives like a river. May we hold on to the aspects of your grace that keeps us afloat and moves us to where we need to be. May your peace walk with us through all of our life's transitions. Amen.
Thank you for joining us today. If the people of Mount Vernon Place United Methodist Church may be of service to you, please email us at mvpumcbaltimore at gmail.com. But for now, may the Lord bless you and keep you until we can meet again. God be with you.